All right, nerds, let's talk about incidents. So, the famed incident expert, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, once said, what is incident severity but a lie agreed upon? And that might sound fatalist to some, but it's actually perspectivist. And so we're going to use this to give us some perspective on severity today. The actual emphasis here is not that severity is a lie, even though it is something that we have just made up completely. Uh, it's that it's something that needs to be agreed upon in order to work. So let's talk about that. First, I'm M. I am a recovering incident commander and currently a product manager at Jelly. That is a picture of me running an incident review there. These are actually all pictures of me taken by my coworkers because clearly they all love me very much. Um, there you go. Okay, so a few years ago, I was fed up with outage thresholds and incident severities, and I decided that I would figure out the right way to do them. I uh, happened to be in the incredible learning from incidents community, and so I spent a lot of time talking to folks across uh, multiple tech companies about their severity levels, how they define them, and how they use them. I've since written, rewritten, refactored, reintroduced incident severity levels at multiple organizations. And I have good news and I have bad news. I'm gonna start with the bad news because it's, it's always better to start with the bad news. The bad news is that there is no correct way to do incident severity. The good news is that there is no correct way to do incident severity. I know I just said that it was bad news, but once you can get over the preconceived notions of how something should be done, you can critically assess how you actually want to do it. So the hard part in this isn't that severity is a lie. It's the agreement. So if you've ever worked with literally any other person outside of yourself, you are probably aware that getting people to agree on something uh, is hard to do. That is difficult work. I have spent years in incident response and I've watched and participated in severity negotiations impeding impact remediation countless times. Is it an orange outage or a yellow outage? I have spent two hours debating this. Instead of solving the incident problem, we went back and forth in a spreadsheet about whether it qualified as yellow or orange. Uh, is this really a SEV-1? 45 minutes of demanding unknown impact information from the only person who could work on impact mitigation. Uh, this isn't an incident, a weekend of arguing between support and engineering because an internal tool was down and technically that didn't have customer impact, but it was a customer service tool that allowed them to view customer accounts so they weren't able to support customers and so it was a customer impacting incident, but we didn't have anything documenting that that service could ever have a customer impacting incident. So we just went around in circles for an entire weekend. None of the people that I was arguing with in any of these examples were wrong. But we didn't have a mutual understanding of what purpose severity serves in an incident. In general, we are not looking for the best way to define severity. We are looking for a way. We are looking for any way to define severity that one, works right now in the immediate future, and two, doesn't get in the way of response. I'm sorry for yelling, I understand that I'm mic. I'm, I'm gonna evoke this later in the talk, but I do want to bring up um, something that, that we call Fisher's Rule, and it is, um, if you think or are asking, is this an incident? It's an incident, declare it as an incident. The severity can come afterwards, so if there's anything that you get out of this, it's that incident, it doesn't actually need severity in order to progress, okay? Incident severity is a gorgeous tapestry of trade-offs. And instead of an entire talk where I yell at you about how you're wrong about incident severity and that you should do this instead, I'm going to offer a series of questions that you should bring home into your organization to help you establish, improve, or if you want to, completely get rid of incident severity as a whole. And asking these questions will help you find what matters most to your organization. So let's get started. What is severity measuring? First one, impact. 
It would be really amazing if we all lived in a world where every alert told us exactly what was wrong, how to fix it, and how it impacted our customers or our services. Does anyone here live in that world? Anyone? That's bragging and it's rude. <laughs> and let's talk later because I, how did you do that? Oh, he was doing a joke. It's not real. It's not real. We don't live in that world yet. So if we're talking about incident impact, what does that mean? Do we have an agreed upon definition of what impact is during an incident? Is it impact to revenue? Is it traffic? Is it impact to individual customers, to individual services? Are there SLAs or SLOs that you're determining the impact from? Are there uptime calculations? Are you determining impacted customer MRR? Percentage of whatever that is or isn't available for seconds or minutes or hours? Is it in a spreadsheet? Because I bet it's in a spreadsheet. If it's not in a spreadsheet, it's on a Confluence page. But does it have an agreed upon definition? And can you measure it? Can you measure it at the beginning of an incident? Can you measure it during an incident? Or can you measure it after the incident? And what are you expecting your engineers to be able to provide? I will tell you a story now, and I will extract the names and locations to protect the identities of these individuals. So when I worked, at a company um, that sent emails professionally. Um, there was a spreadsheet that contained all of the outage thresholds in it. And eventually, one by one, all of the other people at the company who had edit access to that spreadsheet left. And so it was just me. I was the only one who could edit that spreadsheet. And no one would know if it was me that edited the spreadsheet. So of course, I wanted to edit the spreadsheet because I wanted to be able to fix some of the issues that we had with these thresholds, with our incident severities. And so I went to one of the teams that we really frequently had a lot of debate with around whether it was this severity or that severity, and I talked to them about the thresholds that were established in this spreadsheet. It turns out it was essentially a um, percentage of events unavailable within 24 hours was the baseline of the spreadsheet. We had a service that had been written 11 years prior by the founder, and there was not a way to know if we were missing events within 24 hours. In fact, there, there was not a way to know if we were missing events within a few days. It was an aggregator. It was very, very hard to determine if anything was missing. And so I found out the thresholds in this spreadsheet. Not only were they in, difficult to determine whether we were actually in an incident, we couldn't actually measure those things. So you need, you need to be able to measure it. It's one of our first priorities here. All right, number one, but again, a second time. What is severity measuring priority? Oh no, priority is subjective. Once I was uh, in my time as a customer support representative in a customer's account, and I may or may not have accidentally made it so that they couldn't access the majority of their account at a given time by entering them into a beta group. Uh, it just so happened that at the same time, a group of CSMs were in their office negotiating the contract renewal. Now, it was one customer, and their account was still usable. But if that wasn't the most stressful Sev Zero incident I have ever been in. I don't know what is. So what is priority? Does it have a agreed upon definition? Is it what services are impacted? Is it specific customers that are high priority than others? Is it specific situations that if you're in that, if it's in a code freeze or you're do during a, uh, a customer event or during a customer conference, is it a calculation of dependencies? It is a specific amount of money paid by impacted customers? What is it? What is priority? Because this is the hardest one to move the needle on because it is subjective. Can it be measured? So I've made the claim that incident severity is based on vibes. And respectfully, when I said this out loud, in my head, I wasn't spelling it with a Z. And I feel like people didn't take me as seriously because it, it was spelled with a Z. But it is, especially priority. It's based on how you feel in the moment of whether it is 
scary and unknown, or if you know what's going on and you have enough information to be able to solve the problem, and it's not a big deal. It is, it's based on vibes. So how do we then make a calculation for this? How do we make this measurable? Can priority and impact coexist as an access to determine severity in a magical formula? No. I tried. This, my friend Ryan McDonald and I tried. Don't take a picture of this slide. Don't do it. Don't do it. Put it down. Don't take it. This isn't going to solve any problems because you know what we found out when we made this very elaborate axis with all of these pieces of information? Those are the vibes. Is it unknown? How do we have a level of urgency? Are people talking about it? How do we feel about it? We can't quantify it in a reasonable way. So don't try and combine them. Incident priority and incident severity, or sorry, priority and impact within incident severity. Don't make anyone do incident math. Uh, I have a terrible story about this, uh, as you might assume. Um, we had an internal tool at another company that I will not be naming to protect its identity. It was called Twincidence. And uh, if you can do math in your head of where I worked, then I just told you exactly where it was. Uh, and it had a tool that when you declared an incident, you had to input multiple different uh, factors of impact in order to get the incident declared. And one of those drop downs was percentage of customer impact. You all are SREs. If you had a drop down that said percentage of customer impact, one of the options was 100%. One of the options was 50 to 70%. Another option was 25 to 50%. And then less than 25%. And then the final option was unknown. Which option would you choose? Just shout it. Shout it out to me now. Unknown. Unknown. Now, would you imagine <laughs> that there were other factors in that dropdown, and if you chose unknown as more than one answer, it would automatically default that incident to SEV1. <laughs> I was on call for every SEV1 at that company, so let me tell you. Having your severity be a calculation that is abstracted from the people on the sharp end who are actually the ones who don't know all of these details but do know the information they have available to them, you are taking the power out of their hands of, of understanding this incident and being able to explain it to the other people around them. It also made me very angry. So, number two, what is severity a mechanism for? During response, do you pull in different teams, page different people, involve different groups based on different severities? Do you communicate differently internally for different severities? Do you communicate differently externally for different severities? After response, does your incident review process change based on severity? such as how much, long you, how much time you have to complete your post-incident review or RCA, how in-depth you go, who you involve, who it gets shared with. Does your SLA to provide an, S to an RCA change? Does the incident created action items on JIRA tickets? Oh wait, this is the wrong thing. This slide. My notes are mixed up. How embarrassing. This one. Pretend like this slide is here because I have to read the slide notes for this slide. Do your incident created action items or project priorities change based on severity? Do their SLAs change? Is this factored into planning? I'd love to see a show of hands. If, if there's severity attached to an action item, does that actually factor into like monthly, quarterly, weekly planning for you all? Anyone? Like it actually factors in? All right, folks, go work there those places. And then finally, does it change? No, nope, these are in the wrong order. Um, does it change after the impact is resolved? So do you change severity after the incident? Does anyone here change severity after the incident or during the incident? Amazing. Do you keep track of it? That group back there keeps track of it. Do you use that information for anything? 
Wait, the group that just raised your hand. Do you use that information for anything? Okay, one begrudging nod. Is it working? <laughs> All right, so we've gone over the questions that we need to ask around what is severity measuring? And we've talked a little bit about what it's a mechanism for. So those are two really important factors. And so the third question I want you to ask is what organizational problem are you blaming on severity and expecting it to solve? I have tricked all of you. All of these questions are secretly to help you figure out the actual problems in your organizations that you're saying are severity problems. Because severity is not the problem. It has to do with how we talk to each other and what we know that we need to do during an incident. Oh no. Does that make this harder? A little bit. But it also, it frees your mind, man. You don't have to attempt to build an increasingly complex way to determine incident severity if you look at this as an organizational issue. And when I say organizational issue, I'm not saying process issue, because an organizational issue is part process, part technical, and part cultural. And honestly, that is what can make it hard to solve. But it's about asking these questions to the folks who are in the sharp end, as well as the folks who are up at the, at the top who care about severity and put it on slide decks and have percentages around how much we're going to reduce the amount of SEV1 incidents that we have every year. So here's the actual questions. All of the other ones are actual questions. These are just more questions. Do you need to fix severity because you're under leveling? So you're saying it's a SEV3 or a SEV4 when really it's a two or a one. So I was in a meeting once with a lot of engineering directors talking about this problem. We had an under-leveling problem at one of the organizations I worked at. And after the meeting, my boss um, pulled me into another call, and he was like, hey, Em, if you want people to take you seriously and listen to you on this, you have to stop using the F word. <laughs> now, I swear I didn't, like, swear that much in that meeting. And I said that to him, well, Dick, I don't think I was using that many fucking swear words. Like, uh, And he said, no, the F word I'm talking about is fear. Because I was saying, your engineers are afraid to declare a SEV1 because it looks bad on their team. There are a lot of expectations that it places on them around process and things that they have to do, hoops they have to jump through, and they're monitored on, their, on the action items from it for a lot longer than they are for anything else. They're afraid. Nobody wanted to hear that. And I think that that's a very important part of talking to the people who are actually trying to determine severity and trying to solve the problems and incidents. Is this is a factor and not having control over these things is a lot of what Dr. Maslik talked about this morning leads to burnout. So if under leveling is a part of it, this is a cultural thing and there needs to be movement from the top on how we treat severities in an organization, severe incidents in an organization, before that change can have effect. And this can be in little ways, the way that it's mentioned in slide decks, the way that it's prioritized in meetings to talk about these kinds of things. Even the way we run incident reviews for SEV0 or SEV1 or RED or P0 incidents, however you classify your severity. We need to talk about them in a way that is blame aware and actually navigates the problems that we're having within our organization. Do you need to fix severity because you're over-leveling? I told you a little bit about how every time there was two unknowns uh, that would default to a SEV1, and I was on call for every SEV1, uh, that burned me out. It also burned out our support people because uh, support was on call for every SEV1 and they had a 10 minute SLA to post to the incident status page. And so they had 10 minutes at the beginning of the SEV1 to come in and say to this engineer who has just declared, I do not know what the customer impact is. What is the customer impact? I have 10 minutes and I need to write it down and put it on a public status page. So overleveling just gives everyone this incredibly tense experience where we're not actually trying to solve the problem and resolve the issue for our customers. We're debating what severity this incident is and whether or not it needs the attention that 
it does probably need, but not in that way. So if you're over leveling, leveling and you're under leveling, if you're over leveling or if you're under leveling, please allow me to introduce you to Fisher's rule. If you are questioning whether it's an incident, declare an incident. I'm gonna say that like six more times. If you're questioning whether it's an incident, declare an incident. I don't even mention severity here. Well, Fisher doesn't mention severity here. This is Fisher's law. I, I, I didn't write it. Um, don't let incident severity get in the way at the beginning of the incident. Declare it, get the people involved that you need. It's often a mechanism to get those people involved. And so if you're over leveling and that pulls people in, we need to be aware of and conscious of burnout. Will talked about this a little bit too. If we're pulling people in, maybe we don't pull everyone in and we say, hey, you hold back because we don't know how bad this is gonna get and we might need you to be awake, alive, and aware later when the engineers who have been working on this to try and figure out what's going on are exhausted. Talk to people. Next one, do you need to fix severity because stakeholders don't know what's going on? Teams external to response don't understand what's happening within response. This is probably the easiest one to solve and it's in the way that I know no engineer wants to hear it you have to tell them things, you have to talk to people, you have to send messages outside of your response channel or your response Zoom. It's a communication issue. It's setting expectations with the people who are stakeholders to this incident. They are a part of response as well. They have responsibilities to their customers and to posting on the status page, to communicating within SLAs for high volume customers, high visibility customers. They have a role within this too. They aren't external to response, they're a part of it. So including stakeholders as the same citizens of response as every other responder is a really quick and fast way to help solve this part of the severity problem. Do you need to fix severity because no one is sure if this means that we need to pull an all-nighter or can we revisit this in the morning? This is more of the smaller organization kind of startup problems towards severity because they're probably not fully defined because, well, can we have incidents? Do we have enough customers to have incidents? Is this a bug or is this something we have to fix right now? Um, this all comes down to setting expectations with each other, um, both internally for the people who are working on the incident and with your customers. It's easier when you're small and it gets harder as your organization gets larger. But if you are not sure whether this incident means you drop everything until it's done or you can kind of push the priority on this, you need some clarity within your incident severities. Well, that rhymed. So what is severity? This is a call back to the beginning. Severity is hopefully measurable. It's partly technical in that it needs to be understood and it needs to be something that we can alert on, that we can observe, that we can have graphs and spreadsheets and lovely things about. We need severity to be something that we can measure because if we can't, we're going to argue for two hours about whether something is orange or yellow and then several weeks later we're gonna find out that the, the orange distribution group is technically within the yellow distribution group in Gmail. And so there's not actually a difference between orange and yellow. And so you spent two hours arbitrating whether an incident was orange or yellow to find out there is not a difference. Sorry, I'm mad about that one too. Severity needs to be measurable. It needs to be something that you can understand and discuss between the groups. Severity should be actionable. I say should, because it depends on whether you're going to use severity as a mechanism to determine who to pull into response, um, if you're going to mobilize responders in a very specific way, but it can also get in the way. So it needs to get out of the way. It needs to be an action. So if you're going to tie severity to a mechanism, make it actionable. It's part cultural. Severity needs to set expectations. This is probably one of the biggest components that I firmly believe in for incident severity. 
is that this is ultimately a conversation of what we understand about the incident so far and what we're able to do about it. If the severity is high, it's because probably we don't know enough about the situation yet to understand how bad it is, or we know enough about the situation to understand how bad it is. And so we have a lot of people who are trying to bring in to solve this problem. So if we have high severity, we're setting those those expectations externally of, of what's going on and pulling in people accordingly. Um, if we have a low severity incident, that's setting an expectation too. You probably don't have to drop every single thing that you're doing, leave every meeting in order to hop into that. It depends. It's all about setting those expectations. What is the action that you are expected to take when you see this number or color or letter? It is not one size fits all. Severity is not a blanket. If your organization is very large and has a lot of diverse teams supporting a lot of products, or you work somewhere that just loves to acquire companies, you can't get a bigger blanket and just throw that larger blanket of severity over everyone and expect it to cover. Um, when I worked at Twilio, I worked at Twilio because they purchased SendGrid, and I had been running the incident severity or the incident severity organization. That's what it felt like. I was running the incident uh, analysis and response program for SendGrid when we were absorbed by Twilio, and I moved into the Twilio incident command team. And one of the places, one of the things they decided is that one of the first areas in integration was going to be incident response. And it turns out it is really hard to try and take separate organically grown incident programs and mush them together under a single established process. And the hardest part of all of that was how different severity needed to be from product to product, from team to team, from you know, entirely separate organization to organization. You when you're sending emails, it is a very different thing from sending text messages or phone calls or Faxes, they did have a fax API. That's why I said faxes. Um, so the understanding here is that it can't be one size fits all and I understand so, so supremely the inspiration, the decision to want to do that, but it's not going to work, especially because if anything, it's going to be frustrating for the responders if what they're used to as a SEV1, a SEV2, a SEV3 changes based on products, features, and services that have absolutely no impact on, on their work and their incidents. So keep this in mind. It's not one size fits all. And it's honestly a really interesting and exciting experience to have different teams go through and determine what they want their severity to be and talk to other teams who have very different expectations of understanding what severity should be for their features or products or, or services that they own. Um, we can do a lot to learn from each other in those situations. Severity is a canary. It is going to sing about those organizational problems, whether you want it to or not. That is the reality of this, is that severity is covering up a multitude of organizational problems of how we talk to each other during incidents, how our, our services talk to each other during incidents, whether we fully understand the way that our systems work and the way that we interact with each other. When it comes down to it, this is a socio-technical component. It is both technical and cultural and process. That's more than both. That's three things. But severity is that canary for those organizational problems, and you need to listen to it, and you need to ask questions. That's where all of this comes out of. And I know, I'm sorry, every single talk I give at SREcon, the, the resolution is that you have to talk to people, and I understand that that's not like an ideal situation <laughs> to ask everyone to do. But that is really the crux of this. When we are talking about socio-technical issues, it comes down to having conversations with people, and they can be tough conversations, they can be difficult, but we are trying to make things just a little bit better for each other so that we can keep doing this, because this is hard work. Responding to incidents over and over and over again is hard. It's stressful. We learned this morning that it's why I have PTSD. Well, I learned that this morning. You all now know that. 
So we do have to consider this as something that is meaningful when it's going wrong. And we have to listen when folks are saying the severity is making this difficult. This isn't a SEV1, this isn't a SEV2. If we're spending time arbitrating severity, that is our sign that we have something we need to change. There's something we haven't heard. There's something we haven't talked about that we need to talk through to understand this problem. And this is why I advocate very heavily for talking about response process during your incident analysis. I know a lot of folks, five whys, root cause, oh, all right, I guess, no. Okay, there we go. Uh, I know a lot of folks want to focus on the technical because there is so much that we need to talk through and understand to be able to, to say how we got here and take those, those findings and those insights and make something actionable out of that. Well, part of that, if you break it open, is also the response process, and a big part of that is severity. So talking through what got in the way, what made things more difficult, what did we spend two hours debating before we started working on the incident? The last one is something that people tend to really not enjoy when I bring it up. Um, severity has got an expiration date on it, and I don't know what it is. You only know when you know, but it's not forever. It is not set in stone, it is not precious. It will get stale and you will start to feel it and it should be something that comes up and that you talk about in your incident analysis. Because if something is getting contentious between declaring incidents or organizing and communicating between the people involved, typically it has to do with the expectations that we're setting the, the things that we're able to measure or not measure, whether we're supposed to take actions or not take actions based on this, this classification of severity, whether it actually fits the incidents that we're seeing, and whether it's indicative of a deeper problem that we're having between teams or between management and the actual people who are resolving incidents. So the most important part of this, and I know, I'm sorry, we have to talk to the people at the sharp end. And I say the sharp end, those are our practitioners. Those are the people who are declaring incidents, who are trying to determine severity. We have to talk to them to understand what is hard, what is getting in the way so that we can solve these problems. And I will let you in on the ultimate secret of my career. This is how you win friends as an SRE. This is how you, you get cohorts to join you on your journey to change the way that people talk about incidents and problems and failures within your organization. You have to care about what they're experiencing. You have to talk to them about this stuff because they will tell you that and they, feeling heard. That was one of the six principles that, that I keep going back to that talk this morning because I cried. I cried during that talk, okay? But what she was saying is if we don't feel heard, it makes things a lot more difficult. We get burnt out and we also, we lose our enthusiasm to solve these problems. And so if we talk to the people who are telling us that there's something wrong and use that information to change something even just a little bit, we can make things better within our organization and for ourselves, it makes our jobs easier, right? So. The most important part of all of this is you have to talk to these people. Use their input, experiment, troubleshoot. You don't have to change all of severity in one go. You can try things in different incidents. You can try things with different teams. Just try something new. So severity is a lie. We've made it up. We can make it up however we want. I think that's great. I enjoy it. But we have to agree on it. And if you figure this out together, if you work as a team with the folks who are responding to incidents, you can figure out how to make severity work in whatever way, shape, or form actually makes sense for your organization. And things will get a little bit better. Thank you. Thanks.